So, what we have right here is an empty bottle of Zoloft pills. And what Zoloft does is you take it and it forces your brain to make more serotonin. You know, it's used to treat depression. You know, so I take these every night before bedtime and basically it just makes me want to kill myself less. Reading Throne of Glass was kind of like taking an anti-Zoloft. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Before I get really started into this, I just want to say that, one, yes, this shirt is available in my merch store, and if you can be the first one to guess where the quote is from, then you win a cookie. Uh, and also I should note that Throne of Glass is a seven book long series, and this video is going to be part one because I only read the first three books in the series, because, like, they're already pretty long, it would take me a long, long ass time to read all seven, and honestly I just don't think I could fit all of it into one video, because I realized partway through the second book I already have plenty of material to work with, so I will be reading the rest at some points in the future, I don't know exactly when. And I will say that this isn't the absolute worst thing I've ever read, I, I mean I'll get into obviously all the reasons why, and you know, spoiler warning, so if you don't want that then you should check out now, but Mostly, a lot of the story ideas are fine, and a lot of the character ideas are also fine, but the plot is just horribly structured, okay? It feels like it was assembled by a small child playing with Legos and a blowtorch. It just... the pieces do not fit together properly. Anyways, I'm ready to get started, but before that, a word from this video's sponsor, Campfire. Organizing stories can be hard. Just ask Sarah J. Moss. But it doesn't have to be. Campfire Pro is a writing software with tons of tools to keep you organized. Its character pages will help you keep track of all your characters with details and backstories. Timelines can help you hammer out all those plot points. You can even track character arcs and use the map view to create all the locations you need. You'll also definitely want to check out the brand new World Building Pack. It's an expansion to Campfire Pro with even more tools to help you build your story's world. Construct new species, items, magic systems, and develop your cultures with religions, philosophies, languages, and giant glass castles with this massive bundle of features. Campfire Pro is a one-time purchase of $49.99, and the World Building Pack is available for an additional $24.99. Do away with all those Word documents and spreadsheets. Keep everything easily accessible with Campfire Pro. Click the link in the description to learn more. Okay, so Throne of Glass, for those who don't know, is all about this teenage girl named Selena Sardothian. And at the beginning of the series, she's already this crazy, badass assassin lady who's been going around doing, well, doing assassin stuff, killing people. Uh, but she was captured a while ago, and she spent the last year in this prison called Endovir. And what that is, is they just capture, like, political prisoners and such, and put them in mines and work them to death. And she's been there for a year. But at the beginning, uh, these two guys come in, and they tell her, Hey, we're the prince of uh, the kingdom, uh, Adeline, that's where we live, and this other guy's the captain of the royal guards, and they tell her, Hey, we're gonna drag you out of here, and you're gonna participate in a tournament to become the king's champion, and if you do that for a couple of years, then you win your freedom. By this point, we're about 25 to 30 pages in. There's already a lot of problems here. <laughs> Okay, so first off, Selena being a badass assassin at the beginning of the story. Now, she's only 18 years old, but I can accept her already being this crazy badass, okay? That's not that weird, it's not that far outside the realm of possibility, and it just works for the type of story that we want to be telling, so, you know, that's fine. Like, having a character be badass and already know how to fight and everything at the beginning of a story can work just fine, especially if it's a story where, like, the conflict isn't about, like, can they be strong enough to defeat these guys, uh, the conflict can be more about, like, an emotional side of things, like, oh, am I doing the right thing, or can I pr protect my friends even though I'm this big badass, I can't do it, so, you know, that sort of thing. There's a lot of places you could go with this, so I'm not too upset with that. The problem is that it mentions multiple times at the beginning that she has already almost escaped from the prison already. She like came within a hair's breadth of escaping and then they caught her and dragged her back. And she's killed a bunch of guards and stuff multiple times. And that's a problem because repeatedly throughout 
not just the first book, but also the second and third, they hearken back to her time at Endovier and talk about how it's like, oh, this is the worst thing ever, it's horrible, I was gonna spend the rest of my life there. But at the beginning, it's more concerned with making her seem cool and making her seem like a capable fighter and making her seem like a badass than it is with making the prison seem scary and seem intimidating. So it doesn't make the prison seem scary or intimidating. It really just doesn't seem that bad. The other thing is that, like I said, there's going to be this big tournament to determine who will become the king's champion, and all the people being put forward are members of the court. So, like, I mentioned one is the prince, his name is Dorian, by the way, and he's putting forward Selena. And then there's other, like, nobles and such who are putting forward their own champions. And so, reading that, you would think, like, oh, okay, this is, like, some sort of Hunger Games thing, they're just gonna go through all these trials, and Selena will eventually come out on top, and it'll be a super big deal. Not really. <laughs> like, I'll get into more of that later. But why would the king allow people who are his political opponents, or political rivals might be a better word for it, why would he allow them to put forward their own candidates? Like, that that really doesn't make sense. And why have this tournament at all? Like, you already have Selena, like, you already know she's this badass, crazy, cool assassin lady. Why not just go to her in prison and say, hey, work for me for five years and I'll give you your freedom. Or work for me forever and I'll give you your freedom. Something like that. Like, she's really not in much of a position to negotiate. But the, the point is, you could just pull her out, like, you don't need to have this competition. And actually, throughout the competition, you wind up killing people who could have been decent servants on their own. We are 30 pages in. And obviously, because this is young adult fantasy, they're gonna try and go into the romance right away, which just doesn't work, and so... Selena, immediately upon seeing Dorian and the captain of the Royal Guards, his name is Chael, by the way, she just immediately starts thinking, wow, those two guys are so cute. But what's even worse is the narrator's description of Selena. At a passing glance, one might think her eyes blue or gray, perhaps even green, depending on the color of her clothing. Up close, though, those warring hues were offset by the brilliant ring of gold around her pupils. But it was her golden hair that caught the attention of most hair that still maintained a glimmer of its glory. In short, Selena Sardothian was blessed with a handful of attractive features that compensated for the majority of average ones. And, by adolescence, she discovered that with the help of cosmetics, those average features could easily match the extraordinary assets. I also just want to point out that the original cover of the book had Selena looking like some sort of drow elf, and in fact, most of the covers of the books look like that. I don't know why, because she's a human in the story, and she... she whatever. But uh, then there's other versions of the cover that look like this. And for no particular reason, I'm gonna put a picture of the author up here. Feel free to draw your own conclusions from that. So Selena agrees to be Dorian's champion, and so he takes her off to the capital, and they have to hide her identity uh, when she's in the tournament. They call her Lillian something. I forget what her last name is. It's not important, but... They call her Lillian, and the reason they give for hiding her identity is that people might underestimate her. Um, they really don't, throughout the trials, uh, underestimate her. They think she's... whatever. It's, it's really not that important. But, once you get to the main setting of the story, the Castle of Glass in Rifthold, that's actually one of the cooler ideas in the story, because it takes place in this gigantic castle, which is, you know, made of glass. Like, it was originally a stone castle, but then all the glass is built around it, and it's, like, absolutely enormous. It's, like, the size of modern skyscrapers and stuff, and, again, it's made of glass, and it's full of, like, all these hidden coves and hidden tunnels and stuff, and that's cool. Okay? When I read fantasy, I want to read about locations like that, because those are really neat. So, I don't have an issue with the Castle of Glass at all. I think the Castle of Glass is actually really cool, and it does kind of highlight how this author had some ideas in there, but they just weren't put together all that well. And I'm not going to say they were executed poorly either, because that's, that's a little bit of a different thing. They just weren't put together well. So, once they're in the glass castle, uh, Selena meets the king, and she meets all the other competitors. And the king is this... 
I don't know how to put this. He's like the dark overlord of this story. Like, he's the king of Adderland, and he has already conquered pretty much their entire continent, okay? He's conquered uh, Terrasin, which is the kingdom where Selena is originally from, and he's conquered a bunch of other neighboring kingdoms, and he's just supposed to be this crazy, powerful, intimidating villain. I'll get more on that later in the video. And, and she meets all the other competitors, and none of them really stand out cool. It's it's whatever. It, it exists. It's, it's a thing. Uh, and then she starts training, because during her year in prison, she got, you know, she was halfway starved, and she just not in proper shape. So she starts training with Chael, and I, I kind of liked that bit. Like, you know, I liked how she wasn't just immediately back in the game as soon as she got out of prison. Like, it does kind of contradict how she was still killing guards and shit while she was in prison, but whatever, whatever. It's not a huge deal. I just... I'm just glad she has to actually work at becoming this master assassin again. Um, the only issue is that, well, I'm not sure how to put this. So, at one point, the book mentions that as she's getting back into shape and as she's getting proper nutrition into her body again, she starts getting her period again. And that makes sense biologically. Like, you know, if you're starved, then women stop having that. But still... Did you need to bring that up? Was that necessary? Now, while all of this is going on, she's just talking with Dorian and Chael, and it's pretty clear from this point that they're trying to set up a love triangle, and mostly just because it's like, that's the kind of book it is. And the issue with that is that she just kind of thinks both of them are pretty. Like, she thinks they're both good looking, there's no real... Like, there's no one moment in there that ever seems to suggest that they actually like each other or that she likes either of them for any reason other than they're good-looking. And honestly, it focuses way more on Dorian, which, again, with this type of story, it's usually pretty obvious from the beginning who's gonna be the winner of the love triangle, winner of the love triangle. But in this case, her relationship, relationship with Chael is, like, so weak that... By the end of the book, I was thinking, like, I, were they even trying to do a love triangle, or was I just imagining that because this is young adult fantasy? I, and I genuinely couldn't tell you the answer. But don't worry, we'll talk more about that later. I just want you to keep that in mind as we're going through this, because this is the first, like, 80-something pages of the book. None of the trials have happened yet, or anything. Like, this is all that's going on. So, Selena goes through a couple of the trials, which are like, you know, there's an archery contest, there's uh, people climbing around the outside of the glass castle trying to capture a flag and be the first one down, you know, that sort of thing. And while all this is going on, in between the uh, competitions, so when, you know, competitors, like, get thrown out after each competition, it's like a season of Survivor or something, uh, but in between all the trials, they're being violently killed. Like, they're finding their corpses, which are, like, ripped apart in places in the castle, and they don't know what's going on, so Selena starts kind of investigating. And while this is going on, she runs into the other three characters that are kind of important to, in this book. Now, the first one is Kane. He's just one of the other competitors, and he's kind of the favored one to win. He's just this kind of big, brutish mercenary dude who's good at fighting. That's... That's kind of it. Like, there's not really a whole lot else to him, but, you know, he's just big, brutish dude, good at fighting, another competitor. Then there is Nehemia, and Nehemia is a princess of a kingdom called Aelway, I think that's how you pronounce it at least, it's this, however you say that, and that was most recently, the most recent conquest by Adderlin, and so she's there trying to sort of protect her people, um, while also not being straight up... Okay, so there's rebellions going on in Aoway, but Nehemia is totally not involved in that in any way. Um, and her and Selena just sort of become friends initially. Like, they just start, you know, they start talking and... I mean, I'm not gonna say that they have an amazing friendship or anything, but I at least bought that they were friends. Like, you know, later on when the narrator says, like, oh, they were friends, I don't find myself going, really? They were... Oh, okay. Like, no, they, they are friends, but there's not a whole lot to her other than that, like, she's this patriotic young lady who wants to protect her people and really hates Adderlin, and I guess she's secretive, 
but I don't know if that's really a personality trait. And uh, the last character that is really important here is this young noblewoman named Caltaine, or Caltaine, I don't know how to say that. And she is someone who is from lower nobility, but she really wants to marry into higher nobility, so she wants to marry Prince Dorian. And she's seeing how he is super into Selena, and she just, she just starts thinking, man, fuck that bitch, I want, I want to do anything I can to ruin her, and so she starts plotting against her. And, well, that's kind of it. She's just kind of a jealous bitch. And so that's the majority of this book, really. Because while there are a couple of trials that it goes into more detail on, some of them it just straight up skips over. Like, there's one, where, so, there's one point where Selena is worried about, uh, well, she's worried about losing, I guess. And then it skips ahead and she's like, the last trial was fine. It was a knife throwing competition, so I won easily. And then the, the the and it just goes on like that. And like that's the interesting bit of this story. Like it's in the summary and everything. Like that's what you're using to draw in your audience. You don't think that'd be important to focus on at all? Jesus Christ. That that's what I mean by this book being poorly structured, and the plot being poorly structured, or really the whole series just being poorly structured in terms of plot, like, there's a lot of stuff that should be in there that's just missing. It's like if you were building a tower of Legos and you just pulled some out of the middle. Like, it might still be able to stand afterwards, but it's gonna be a lot shakier. Anyways, while Selena is investigating the violent murders of the other competitors, she, like, goes to the library and she starts investigating some of the hidden tunnels that she finds in, like, her room and stuff. And while she's in the library, she finds out a couple of important things. Uh, one, she finds a copy of The Walking Dead. And apparently, what, what happened is that, that uh, there are multiple, like, dimensions in this setting. And The Walking Dead somehow came from our world into theirs. That's kind of stupid, but I can work with it. Like... I feel like they could have found something else that they could bring from a different world, or even if they wanted to go with our world, they could have something that's a little more interesting and a little less dumb, but whatever. I can work with that for now. That's just another thing that, keep in mind, we'll talk about it later. And uh, she also finds some more information about uh, what happened to magic, because in this world, magic just stopped working 10 years earlier. Or rather, on their continent it stopped working 10 years earlier. On other continents it still works fine. And they don't know exactly why or what happened, but that's also around the time that the King of Adderlin outlawed magic, and if anyone's found practicing it, they get executed. While Selena's investigating, she finds some hints that maybe the King of Adderlin somehow suppressed all this magic, and somehow he's the reason it's not working anymore. Uh, and there's no confirmation of that, but that's what she thinks, and that's what other people are whispering about, but obviously you can't be saying it out loud, otherwise you might get executed. That's also okay. That, that's an okay idea. I kind of like how that works. Uh, but while she is investigating some of the tunnels, she finds this tomb with the ghost of Queen Elena in it. Now, Queen Elena was this other... Well, she was a queen of... Uh, either Terracin or Adeline, I forget, and I can't be bothered to check, but uh, she was a queen of one of those places, like, many hundreds, thousands of years ago, when there was a portal to a demon world that opened, and demons poured in and almost killed everybody, and she was one of the people that fought them back. <clears throat> and Elena and Selena, once she gets over, like, oh, hey, I'm talking to a fucking ghost, <clears throat> they just start talking, and Elena's like, hey, beware of the king of Adeline, blah, blah, blah. She's not actually very helpful, but she does tell Selena about what to do at a couple of points. There's Honestly, there's not that much to say. A little bit later on, while she's uh, going through the tunnels and investigating, she finds Cain doing some sort of bizarre magic ritual in a hidden chamber, and while she's watching, he sees her and he summons a demon, and the demon attacks her, but she manages to run down to Elena's tomb and grab a sword, and she kills it. And she almost dies, but she doesn't. She lives. And uh, she gets away, but Cain has also escaped by this point, 
and she doesn't say anything to anyone about him summoning it, pro partially because they w probably wouldn't believe her anyways, but now she knows, like, okay, he's the one that's behind killing all these dudes. So then it gets to the final trial, which is four people. There's Kane, Selena, and two others, and that one is just a duel to not the death, but you get your opponent into a position where they can no longer fight, and you're actually not supposed to kill your opponent. Uh, and so Selena defeats the first guy, easy. Kane defeats his first guy, easy. And then they're about to fight each other. Now, <clears throat> while this happens, Selena gets poisoned, and she fights him using an, just a wooden staff with an iron uh, rod at the end that uh, Nehemia gives to her. Uh, remember the princess that I mentioned earlier, they're friends. And she gives it to her and she's like, hey, this is like the spirit of the people of Aleway, blah blah blah. And hearing that, you might think it's magic or something. It's not. It's just a regular staff. And considering that Selena is mostly used to fighting with swords and daggers, and that she's fighting this d guy who, one, is much bigger than her, and also has a lot of combat experience, and has k pl killed plenty of people before, You'd think she'd want to use something she's more familiar with, but instead she's like, yeah, you're right, I'll take this rod. And, um, <clears throat> right before she drinks some... Look, she gets poisoned by Caltane, the jealous noblewoman who wants to fuck Dorian. And, uh, while she's fighting, she... And while she's not able to fight very well, and she starts seeing demons and stuff that nobody else can see, and Kane is using magic on her, blah blah blah... And she almost dies, but she manages to win in the end. Cool. And Lady Caltaine loses her shit while she's watching with everybody else, and she starts yelling, and she literally turns to this other nobleman there, and she starts yelling about how, you told me that when we were poisoning her, when we were breaking the rules, when we did our evil plan, like she literally just tells everybody her evil plan, and then the other guy's like, what are you talking about? I had nothing to do with that. And then so she gets arrested and dragged away. Cool. And then, uh, well, that's, that's basically the end of the story. Like, Selena is now the king's champion, and she's gonna be his assassin. Oh, and the king specifically mentions, um, like, that he knows she's friends with Nehemia and Cheol and Dorian now, and so he set, mentions, like, hey, I'm holding them hostage. If you decide to not do what I say, I'm gonna execute some of them. And so that, that actually makes sense. Like, like, you know, it, it, that's how he keeps her from just running off and leaving. So, the problem with this first book is that it's just a prologue. Like, the entire story is just setting up what's to come later. Like, and later it's, you know, Selena being the king's assassin and deciding, I don't want to do this, and realizing, okay, he's evil overlord, all that stuff. And it's, ju it's just a prologue is the problem. Like, most of the exposition and stuff could be folded into the next two or three books without losing really that much. And again, I already mentioned the competition is kind of stupid, and the author seems to almost think it's stupid too because she skips over so much of it, and it just gets pushed almost to the back burner. And I'm not even bringing up, like, the smaller dumb issues, like how Chael is apparently captain of the guards and he's only 22, which is kind of weird, but again, I can work with that on its own. But he's also, again, captain of the guards, and he's the one that goes to Selena's room and wakes her up every morning. Like, you'd think he'd have one of his underlings do that. And also how Selena is like, oh, I don't want to wake up, and she's, like, bitching about not having enough pretty dresses, and then when she does have pretty dresses, she's, like, drooling over them. And how she just loves dancing at balls, and how she loves to read and all that. Like, she, she really doesn't feel like this badass assassin. She feels like... A, a whiny bitch, honestly. Well, you know what? That's not very charitable. She, she feels whiny. I don't know if I'd call her a bitch, but... I don't know. That's the whole first book, and... It doesn't get much better from here. So now we go to the second book, which is called Crown of Midnight. Now, it starts off with Selena being the king's assassin now. Like, she's going off and killing folks, and she's already... It's only like a month or two later, and she's already killed several targets for him. Now, the first major issue <laughs> with this is that, remember I mentioned the love triangle between her, Dorian, and Chael, and 
how it was very clearly leaning towards Dorian, and it's like, yeah, okay, Selena and Dorian are gonna be a thing, and Chael is just gonna be off to the side. And her thing, her relationship with Chael was so weak that I wasn't even sure they were actually trying to do that, and I might have been imagining it. But within the first couple pages of this book, her and Chael are apparently dating, or dating, and it's just completely forgotten about Dorian. So, and, and like, they, they don't even really bring up that she was attracted to Dorian before. And so even just setting aside their lack of romantic chemistry, I find it really funny because it seems to me like Sarah J. Moss was at first thinking, yeah, okay, I really want her to end up with Dorian. But after the first book, she decided she didn't like that, or she decided it didn't really make sense, and so she just changed her mind and shifted it over to Chael, but she didn't actually do that in the story. She just decided, uh, yeah, retcon. <laughs> it's just really stupid and funny. So, pretty early on, we discover that Selena is not actually killing the targets that the king sends her after. She's going up to them saying, hey, you need to disappear, I'll fake your death for you, just run away. And then they're doing that, and she's bringing, like, fake corpses to the king, and he's believing her. Sure, that's fine. Uh, she's also living in immense luxury, which, like I said, doesn't make her seem like much of an assassin, but <sighs> whatever, that's not, not the worst thing ever, whatever. Um, and then uh, she keeps going down to the tombs to talk to the queen, Elena, and while she's there, she meets this magical talking doorknob named Mort. Um, and that's not too stupid, I don't think. I, it, I wouldn't even really say it's stupid at all in a fantasy setting. Like, you know, there's magic. And she's asking, like, but wait, magic is broken. And he's like, well, my spell was cast before the magic got broken, so it's fine. And, you know, just that sort of thing. And Mort is not great, but he's a little bit funny now and again. So, you know, not a huge issue. And, but he's mostly just there for exposition, so whatever. So her next target is this guy named Archer, who is uh, the King of Adderland thinks that she's working with, or thinks that Archer is working with the rebels, so he sends Selena after him, and she actually knows him from before, so she's like, hey, dude, I'm gonna fake your death, but, so just run away. I'm gonna give you a little bit of time, but before then, just get your shit together and then leave. And he tells her, but wait! If you don't kill me, I can give you information about, you know, the rebels and about what's going on, that sort of thing. And apparently the heir to Terrasin, which again is where Selena is from, uh, apparently the rebels think that the heir to the throne there is still alive and they're ga looking for her or gathering around her or something, but he doesn't really know that much about it. And so she's like, okay, just feed me info and I'll leave you alone for a while. Now, this is fine. This isn't... This is actually okay, <clears throat> but again, wait, it gets worse. So while Selena is investigating, uh, she almost gets killed by somebody, uh, but she manages to kill him first, and then she drags her ass back to the castle, and Chael finds her, gets her to a healer, and uh, so they argue about the, the assassinations. Chael's like, I can't believe you're doing all this for the king, even though he's also loyal to the king, and he's protecting the king, and he's helping the king, and throughout this whole series so far, a pretty big part of his character has been his reluctance to do anything against the king, but whatever, we'll, we'll set that aside. Uh, but yeah, he argues about that, and then eventually Selena just tells him about how she's faking the deaths and how she hasn't killed anybody, and he seems relieved, and then they bang, and... Well, that's it. They, they bang. They, they have sex. That's not even really treated as a big deal in the story, I don't think. So, while all of this is going on, Prince Dorian has a few little interludes where the story follows him, and apparently he has magic now. Like, he he loses control of his temper a few times, and he's like, oh, shit, things are, like, freezing around me, and th this isn't good because if Father finds out, I will be killed. I need to look into this. So he goes to this carnival or traveling fair that's nearby, and there's a fortune-telling witch there, and so he talks to her, asks her about it, and she says, yeah, you have magic, and also there's still magic around. The king couldn't get rid of all of it. And she seems to kind of confirm that, like, yeah, the king of Adderlin 
was the one who uh, broke magic. I guess that's the best way of putting it. Suppressed magic, maybe, might be a better word for it. I don't know. And while all of this is going on, we also find out about this thing called the Witch Kingdom that used to exist. Now, this is another one of those like ideas for like the setting, for the world building, that I think is really cool, and it's just not explored properly, at least not yet. Because what it is, is apparently witches are a separate species from human in this. They live a really long-ass time, they can use magic, they have iron teeth and their nails are also iron, and they're just really strong, really fast, and, you know, all that kind of crazy stuff. And they apparently used to have their own kingdom somewhere on the continent, and it was destroyed about 500 years before the story takes place, and so it's mostly a wasteland now, but there are witches that want to bring it back. That's really cool. I, I like the idea of, okay, this powerful kingdom that used to be ruled by magic users, and now it's gone and they're trying to bring it back. I, I think that's a cool idea. It's just they haven't really done all that much with it yet, at least not in the first three books. They might do more later, and I'm actually holding out hope that they will, because... As strange as it may sound, I actually want these kind of books to be tolerable. Archer and some of his rebel friends take Chael hostage, and they leave a note, and Selena finds it, and she loses her shit and goes after him. Now, they have him chained up in this warehouse area, and, uh, or this, I guess it is just a warehouse, and so Selena, being angry, she literally jumps from a roof across the street into the warehouse through a window, and then she kills like 20 people, and then Archer tells her, wait, wait, you can just have chill now, you can go. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. For starters, she's an assassin. You know, wouldn't it be neat if just once there was a story that focused on an assassin, and they weren't super badass fighters? Like, they were good at sneaking around and poisoning people, like, and just being unseen. Like, you know, the stuff that assassins should do but they weren't, like, these mega ultra-badass warriors. Like, and while all that was happening, while Selena was just cutting through these guys, which is a very boring action scene, by the way. Like, all, most of the action scenes in this are just like, yeah, she killed 20 guys like a whirlwind, and then everyone was like, what? And then she won. Like, that's how most of them are written. But while all this was going on, I realized that Selena is basically just an edgy rogue character being played by a first-time D&D player. Because, think about it, she has the backstory, her parents were killed, she was taken in by this master assassin and trained as an assassin, and then she spent time in prison, and now she's being forced to kill against her will, and like, all that. It's like, it has the elements of an edgy backstory, but the player doesn't really know how to play the edgy character very well, so she still winds up being pretty nice overall, except when her friends get hurt. And she also doesn't really know how to play as a rogue, because she just charges in and attacks everybody rather than sneaking around. And, but, you know, she's a first-time player, so the DM just goes easy on her and actually lets her win. That's what this entire series feels like to me. So anyways, while she's away rescuing Chao, uh, Nehemia, back at the castle, winds up being killed. And I should mention that her and Nehemia were also arguing about her being the king's assassin, and Nehemia was upset with her, but she never told her that she was faking the deaths. Anyways, Nehemia is killed. Selena kind of gets really sad, loses her shit, almost kills Chael, and then uh, she gets arrested, thrown in the dungeons for a while. She runs off, uh, gets revenge on the guy that killed Nehemia. Uh, he was working on someone else's orders, though. And then uh, she... Uh, actually, he was... Kind of sort of working on Archer's orders, but eh, that's, that's a little too complicated. I'm probably not even going to go into it here. Whatever. Uh, but yeah, she gets revenge, and then um, at, Sel uh, not Selena, at Nehemia's grave, Selena sings this song for her, and Chael's like, wait, I don't recognize the language that's in. I think that's the language of the Fae. Because, oh yeah, Fae exist in this world. <laughs> they just don't really show up or are even mentioned very much until this point. So... Anyways, she goes down into the catacombs where Elena's ghost hangs out, and she finds this poem. And then she goes to the fair and speaks to the same witch that Dorian spoke to. And the witch is, like, shocked by this poem that she brings up. And when she presses her on the issue a little bit more, she, the witch brings up how 
you know, a long time ago, demons came through from another world, and that's what uh, Queen Elena was fighting. And they managed to seal the opening to the other world using these three things called weird keys. Or word keys. Weird, word keys, whatever. And uh, apparently the three word keys are like full of just crazy, immense power, unlike anything else in the world. And if you were to gather all three of them, then you could open the portal and bring in hordes of demons into the world. But if you only had one or two, you could still open it a little and bring in a couple of demons. And the witch uh, specifically mentions that she thinks the king of Averlon has one of the weird keys and he used that to suppress magic. Now, again, that's a pretty neat idea. I, I like that. And it seems to be trying to set up the king as this, again, as this powerful, imposing figure, but he's in this story so little that it just doesn't work. But anyways, uh, the witch tries to kill Selena. It doesn't work. Selena kills her. And, cool, she goes back to the castle, starts investigating more magic stuff. And this is where I have to bring up The Walking Dead again. Because while she's in the castle library, she just finds the book again, and she looks through it, and apparently there are spells in there that she can use and that still work despite the king's suppression of magic. Like, she found a copy of The Walking Dead graphic novel, you know, the story about people on the east coast of the U.S. fighting zombies, and it, has, it came from our world into theirs, and they start casting magic spells from it. And when I read that, it felt like someone was playing a prank on me. Like, like Sarah J. Moss wrote, like she didn't write that in most of her books. Like, like most copies of the book don't have anything about The Walking Dead in it. But just specifically the ones that I got had that little bit thrown in there just to fuck with me. Like, I'm gonna bring this up and other people are gonna be like, I've read those books, I don't remember anything about the walk- it, it feels like that's what's happening. So, anyways, while she's casting spells from The Walking Dead, uh, Dorian also shows up, and, uh, they're walking around in the hidden tunnels, and, uh, anyways, a demon shows up, and her and Dorian manage to kill it using, uh, both Selena's badassness and Dorian's, uh, new magic, and she's like, whoa, Dorian has magic, that's crazy. And, uh, Anyways, after they kill it, they find Archer, who's also down in the catacombs, whatever you want to call them, just the hidden areas, and he has a book, and he's, like, casting this weird spell when they find him, he's going through this ritual, and apparently he... I just... He killed Nehemia. It doesn't really make sense why, but he did. And then he opens a portal, and another demon comes out, and they start fighting it while Archer runs away. And at some point... Uh, Selena goes inside the portal with uh, some of her friends, so like they go to the other world, and while she's there, she turns into like this fey form, you know, which I, I assume that that's what this drow elf looking thing on the cover of most of the... I assume that's what that's supposed to be. I assume that's supposed to be her fey form, but whatever, I, I don't actually know. And while she's there, she like shoots out fire and, you know, does magic and stuff. She kills the demon. And then uh, when they leave, everyone's like, yo, Selena, what was that? And she admits, okay, I'm part fae. Like, she, uh, what it is is apparently her great-grandmother was a fae, which means she's only one-eighth fae. So Selena is just as much fae as I am Japanese, which is to say not very much. But uh, anyways, um, yeah, she does that. She runs after Archer. He begs for his life. She's like, oh, Nehemia would have let you go, but I'm not a good person. Whatever. She tries to be badass. It doesn't really sound that badass. She kills him. And then, not long after that, uh, the king sends her on a mission to another country called Wendlin, which is, like, across the ocean from them on another continent. And he says, yeah, he sends her there to assassinate the royal family so that the country will be thrown into chaos and Adderlin can invade and take over. And she's like... Yeah, okay, I can do that. And in the back of her head, she's thinking, like, okay, I can actually do other stuff while I'm there. And, uh, while it's happening, Chael starts... He, he realizes, hey, she's part fae. And then he's like, that, that's a little weird. And he starts uh, looking through genealogical records of uh, Terrison's 
nobility, Terrison's royal family. And he remembers that Selena said that her parents were killed on the edge of a riverbank and she only escaped by jumping in. And he looks at it and he looks at the, uh, apparently the daughter of the royal family of Terrison uh, was killed when she fell into a riverbank and she was also one-eighth fae and he just realizes, oh, Selena is the princess of Terrison, the lost princess, and he is just like, oh shit, I'm sending her to Wendland, she has family there, she's gonna not do what the king says, even though by this point I kind of think the king is evil, this is bad, and that just that's how it ends. And, okay, I'm not saying that reveal can't be done well, but it just feels weird coming at the end of the second book, because the, the, this first two books are kind of structured almost like it's going to be a trilogy, but then it just goes on much longer. So had this second book been the second entry in a trilogy, that might have been okay, but as it stands, it just feels weird, because like I said, the whole first book feels like a prologue, and this one feels like, well, the actual story is starting to get going, but it still has a lot of bits that feel like it's just there to exposit, you know? And so, had you sort of combined them and cut out some of the unnecessary bits, then that might have worked as a good reveal at the end, but as it stands, it just, it just feels like it's in an odd place. And that comes back to, again, the same problem over and over again. The plot is just poorly structured, and a lot of the events should happen in different orders, I think. So now we move on to the third book, which is the final one we'll cover today and that one is called Air of Fire. Now, there's three main storylines in that that don't really intersect, so I'm just gonna go... and Selena's takes up the bulk of the time, uh, so I'm gonna get to her last, but they don't really intersect at all, and so I'm just gonna go over them one at a time. Now, the first one follows a new character whose name is Manon, and she's a witch. Now, first time you see her, we realize she's just fucking crazy. She just likes killing people, she likes causing pain, she's just a sadistic, crazy person. Cool. Um, and her storyline is, well, it's interesting in that it gives a little bit more insight into witches and witch culture and some other aspects of the setting. Like, you know me, I'm a sucker for good world building, and I like that we're getting to see some of this stuff from a different angle. Um, but it does feel a little odd at this point, because for most of the books up until this point, it's felt like magic does not play a huge role in this world, and that there aren't that many magical creatures running around. Because when demons come up, it's like, oh shit, demons, that's a big deal. Uh, but apparently witches are just, like, you know, they're rare, but they're also like, yeah, they're, they're there. They're just sort of normal. Maybe normal's not the right word, but, you know, they're not that... It's not that big a deal if you find one. So... And that happens a little bit later on, too. Like, Selena runs into some skinwalkers, and it just feels weird. Like, oh, uh, I guess skinwalkers just sort of walk around in this world? Like, had it been that... Had, had it been brought forward earlier that characters could run into magical creatures, like if they saw, like, just some pixies flying around or something, or, like, there's a dragon flying in the background or something like that, then it... It probably could have worked, because it'd just be like, oh, skinwalkers, okay, that's just a different type of ma magical creature, that's... Okay, that's a thing. But as it stands, both that and the witches feel just a little bit off. Like, like it's a good piece of the story, but it doesn't fit in to the right place quite right. So, the majority of Manon's storyline is just her basically trying to prove herself as the heir to becoming, like, the leader of the witches, because, uh, she... the witches are working for the King of Adderlin, and apparently they're just training. And again, that's... this whole book, really, is just they're training to go to Adderlin to kill all the rebels with the king, and then they're gonna go back to the Wastes and try and restore the Witch Kingdom, and Manon is going to be, uh, the heir to that. And, okay, that... that doesn't sound great on its own, and it really isn't, because, again, the, the whole story is mostly just training. But, um, basically, a quick run-through is that they're training with Weaverns, because they ride Weaverns into battle, and uh, the various witches are kind of fighting over which Weavern is the best one, because they all want to get the best pick. And at first, Manon wants to get this really big, aggressive one named Titus, 
Uh, but they put Titus into a pit with a bait weaver, and while Manon is watching them fight, she sees the bait weaver, and even though it's a lot smaller, is like a much better, more ferocious fighter, and she's like, oh, okay, that one's a warrior, it wants to survive. So she kills Titus and helps, and takes that one. She names it Abraxos. And at first that kind of made sense, like it made sense why she would want it, because like, okay, it's a fighter, it's, you know, it's, uh, even if it's not the biggest, it's gonna be the best one. But as it goes on, you realize that Abraxos is like crippled, and they have to, re they have to put some of his teeth, they have to give him fake teeth, and they have to give him fake spikes on his tail, and they have to go through this whole thing getting spider silk so that she can uh, repair his wings because his wings are crippled, and it just, it feels, I don't know, at first it made sense, but as it goes on, you realize, like, it would have been just a lot smarter for her to pick the first one, but okay, whatever. And then at the end, um, she just proves herself, becomes leader in a not particularly interesting climax. It's just her flying on Weaverns, and then she saves somebody's life, and whatever. And I guess on its own, the storyline isn't awful, but it feels really, really disconnected from the rest of the book. And keep in mind, these are all pretty long, okay? This last one, Era Fire, this copy here is 565 pages. That's, that's like, good length for an epic fantasy. For young adult fantasy, that's really, really long. And when you're that long, you don't need to have every little bit of the story in there. There's a lot that you can cut out. It's just, it's really obnoxious. The second storyline follows Dorian, Cheol, and this new character named Sorsha all back at the Glass Castle. Now, okay, a lot of this is sort of like, I don't want to say political intrigue, because it's really not. It's basically just like, hey, there's some stuff we have to keep secret from the king. But it's, again, it's not awful, it's just that, like Manon's story, it feels a little disconnected, or rather parts of it feel disconnected and could have been cut out. And for a book this long, you really should have cut it out. But anyways, uh, so Sorsha is a healer at the castle, and she's also in love with Dorian. And I know they could come up with a reason for why she's in love with Dorian, but the author decided not to because the narrator literally just says she was in love with him from the moment she saw him, but she's a commoner, and she would get in trouble if she tried anything, so cool. Anyways, uh, she finds out about Dorian's magic, and she helps him get it under control so it doesn't go crazy at an inopportune moment, and he gets in trouble. Okay, that's fine. But the biggest part of this storyline is Cheol meeting this new guy named Adion, who is, uh, well, he's Selena's cousin, for starters, and he is... Basically, he is the general that works up in Terrasin, and he's suppressing all the rebels. So, like, even though he's from Terrasin, he is, quote, a loyal subject to the king, and he does what he asks and all that. But, uh, apparently, he is also working with the rebels, and he's feeding them info, and Chael tells him about Selena being the princess, and her real name is Aelin, by the way, but that, that just, that sounds weird, and by now she has three names that she's known by, so I'm sticking with Selena. But anyways, so yeah, he, he gives them that info, they start working together, and well, that's pretty much the whole plot line. Like, they're just finding out little tiny bits of information and sending them off and trying to avoid being caught. And in the end, they find out how the king uh, took away magic. And what he did was he built these three towers all around the continent, which form a sort of triangle, and somehow those are suppressing magic, and they think if they destroy any one of them, then that will fix things. And I'm like, okay, that, that's kind of cool. That's a neat idea, and it definitely s sets itself up for some fun adventures later on, so I got, I got no issue with that. Uh, but a the king finds out about their activities, so he takes all of them hostage in his throne room, and he kills Sorsha, uh, which apparently she was feeding the rebels info while all this was going on. Um, all right, whatever. Also, Dorian falls in love with her too at some point, so he loses his shit, and uh, he starts fighting the king, but the king, using his word key, is able to defeat him, and the others run away. 
Now, I will say that all these three storylines have their own climax. And of the three, that's the only climax I actually kind of liked, because I know I was describing it in very unflattering terms a second ago. But uh, when they're first taken prisoner, and the king is like threatening to execute Sorsha on the spot if they don't tell him anything, it really does, it, it really is a pretty tense scene. And it really does feel like, oh, if they fuck up, this girl's gonna get killed. And while she's not an amazing character, while I don't particularly like her, I would still feel bad for her, and I would still feel bad for Dorian, because he's not super interesting, but he's at least a decent person. So, while all of this is going on, it does actually feel pretty tense, and when Sorsha is killed and when Dorian is captured, it is actually kind of sad. But the others manage to get away, and you're like, okay, they'll fight another day. So, this climax works. Okay, it's not amazing, but it works. So the third storyline, which, like I mentioned, takes up the majority of the book, follows Selena in Wendland, the other country where she was sent to kill the royal family. And while she's there, she, uh, at first, like, just looks out and sees the prince of the country, who's, like, her distant cousin or something, and she just kind of hates him because his people love him. Okay, cool. Uh, she obviously doesn't try to kill him. She runs off and tries to meet her great-great-aunt Maeve, who is, uh, like, the queen of the Fae. And so, while she's there, she meets this other Fae whose name is Rowan, and he takes her over to where Queen Maeve is. And her Ma Maeve, her aunt, refuses to tell her about the word keys, because Selena's like, hey, I want to know about the word keys, I want to know where I can find the other two that the king doesn't have, and what sort of powers they do have, and what how I can destroy them, maybe, or if I can't destroy them, how I can at least hide them. But Maeve refuses to tell her until she gets her magic under control, because, you know, like, uh, like I said, when she went through the portal into that other world and fought the demon, she could breathe, or not breathe fire, but she could shoot out fire and stuff, but she can't really figure out how to do it in the real world, because she is just constantly in her human form, she can't shift into her fey form, she just, she just can't control it. So, uh, Maeve has Rowan train her, and this is kind of an issue, because, well, not only is the majority of this storyline just her training and her learning to use her magic, like, that's kind of boring on its own, and it's not done particularly well, but what makes it even worse is that, up until this point, Selena has been this crazy badass assassin. Like, she's already known how to fight, she's already known how to do a lot of stuff, so she hasn't really had to learn. It's been more about, okay, investigating stuff and using her skills in important ways and meeting new friends, blah blah blah. But now she's going from being this crazy badass to just being this trainee. And it feels like a bit of a whiplash in terms of her character growth. Like, it feels like character regression, almost. Even though it really isn't, to go back to D&D, it's multi-classing into a magic class, but it just feels off. You know, like, it, it doesn't feel like something that character would do. Also, while all of this is going on, she has a crazy lady boner for Rowan, so... I, I guess we're just trying to go back to... Love Triangle or something. Whatever. And so, while all this is going on, he's trying to get her to shift into her fey form, and she just cannot do it. Uh, he finds that the only way to get her to do it is to just get her angry, and then she'll she'll turn. Okay, that's fine. But uh, the first time he does it, he, like, bites her, and she gets angry, and turns into her fey form, and is, is able to shoot out fire and stuff. And, I mean, that's fine, but I feel like in a story like this, you should have it happen once, maybe twice, and then after that, like, okay, she can control it at least somewhat. Whereas in this, it happens once with her being bitten, uh, twice. The second time is with, uh, like I mentioned before, skinwalkers. They get attacked by some skinwalkers and almost die, but she manages to shift at the last second because she hates them so much and then kills them. And then the third time, when Rowan takes this innocent kid hostage and uh, puts him in a position where she has to save him and she can't save him unless she gets goes all fake. Uh, and after that, she finally can sort of control it, mostly. But that takes up several hundred pages of the book. Oh my god. Like, if I can describe it in that much detail and give you the whole gist of that, like, 
that is bad, okay? That is very, very bad. Like, I'm getting Wheel of Time flashbacks here. Because as much as I like Wheel of Time, it's a very horribly structured series, because there are entire books where basically nothing happens, nothing advances, and this feels a lot like that. So once Selena manages to get her magic under control, demons attack. And I should mention real quick that the way magic works in this is not super interesting or unique, but it's at least a little bit different, because what it is is people who only have a little bit of magic inside them, they can only do a little bit at a time, but it refills quickly, whereas people like Selena and Rowan, who have a whole lot of magic, they can do crazy stuff, but once the reservoir is empty, it takes much longer to fill up, so they have to rest for days afterwards. That's actually kind of cool. I do like that idea. But anyways, you know, demons attack, and they're under the control of the King of Adderlin. And so Selena just fights them using her fire, and she manages to kill them eventually. But uh, before they kill her, or before she kills them, they, they like, feed off of her pain, I guess. So they, like, drag her into this dark sphere, and so they can't see her or anything, and they just start feeding on her bad memories. And she's like, no, this is awful. And honestly, the climax would be okay, but there is just a really obnoxious flashback in the middle, which shows Selena as a child. Uh, she was in Terrasin with the royal family, and the King of Adderlin actually came for a visit, and apparently her powers went out of control, but uh, it wasn't her fault, it was actually the King of Adderlin that did it, whatever, and then Adderlin attacked, killed her parents, and she manages to escape, and apparently the big twist here is that her parents sacrificed themselves to get her to safety. That's... That's not much of a twist, really. That, that feels pretty standard especially for a story like this, but whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, like I said, the climax could be good, but there's just... It's just that obnoxious flashback in the middle really wrecks the pacing of it, so it, it it's, it's bad. Of the three, I would say this is the worst. And also, when it happens, there's still 90 pages left in the book, so when I got to the end of it, I was like, well, what the fuck is going to happen now? So after that, Selena finally goes back to Maeve, and now that she has her magic under control, Maeve tells her about the weird keys, and she doesn't tell her that much about them. She tells her that uh, the King of Adderlin probably already has two, and one of them is this, like, black ring that he wears. And uh, while she's listening, Selena realizes that uh, this amulet her parents gave her is the third one. And uh, she realizes, oh, okay, I lost that years ago, and now my old assassin master has it, so she knows, okay, I have to go back to the other continent, and I'll get it there. And so we know that's where the second, the next book is going to be. And also, while this is happening, uh, she manages to convince Maeve to let Rowan out of his, like, blood oath to her, so... And then Rowan makes a blood oath to Selena, so now he's her forever servant. And anyways, the book ends with her getting on a ship back to the other continent, and she's thinking, I'm gonna be queen! Even though she's never wanted to be queen before this, like, w throughout the whole assassin bit at the beginning of Crown of Midnight, at the beginning of the second book, she's only thinking about how I just gotta keep this up for a few more years and then I'm free. I'm on my own. And it's just... Why? Like, th this character could be good, but she just goes in so many different directions at once that nothing feels as though it's natural progression. So, even though she's far from, like, being the bitchiest character ever, or the stupidest character ever, or the most whiny character ever, just nothing feels consistent with her, and so... Well, it's, it's just dumb. So, like I said, um, this isn't, like, the worst series I've ever read, at least not so far, but it is very long, and the story is very poorly structured, which makes it feel even longer than it really is. Like, if the story was just... Uh, if it was just rearranged a bit, like the first book being basically a prologue and having a whole lot of unnecessary training in the third book, you could probably have made these a lot better if you just cut a lot of that out and rearranged some of what was left, but 
as it stands, it's just... Man, it, it's obnoxious. And not to mention that a lot of the exposition in here is supposed to be like a shocking twist, but they always, always have to use it as a shocking cliffhanger. Like, it can't just be like, oh, that's a twist, let's examine it a little further. Like, Selena being the Princess of Terracin. And there's really... That, that's kind of a, a... feels like a twist just for the sake of having a twist, because there's not much hinting at it beforehand. Like, as far as we knew, Selena was just some orphan who became an assassin, but... I... Whatever. And, you know, the world building is kind of the same way. Like, it's a lot of good ideas, it's a lot of good individual pieces, but they're just kind of thrown together and they don't fit together all that well. Like I mentioned, the Glass Castle is really cool. It's a really cool setting. It's kind of obnoxious that all three of the books so far have had a lot of time spent there, but it, it's still really cool. I like to imagine that. Uh, and the Witch Kingdom, that's a cool idea. I like that. And, uh... I guess a lot of the stuff with the Fae is kind of interesting because, you know, they are immortal and very powerful and they don't really, they feel kind of alien, I guess would be a good word for it. More than anything with this book, or with these books, I'm frustrated and kind of disappointed so far. Like, I don't think it's the worst thing ever, yet, there's still four books, it could go really bad, but it man, it could be so much better. And I know I haven't really talked about the characters so far, but most of them are just kind of bland, because in the end, they're all defined by the romantic relationships. Like, Chael is pretty much completely defined by his romantic relationship with Selena. Dorian is completely defined by his romantic relationship with Selena at first, and then later on his relationship with Sorsha. And Rowan, the, the fey trainer from the third one, is just defined by this sad backstory he has about how his girlfriend was killed, and just, that's really all there is to most of these guys. And the only one that really isn't is the King of Adderlin, but the thing is, he, um... Well, they're tr like I said, they try to paint him as this intimidating, crazy powerful villain that we're supposed to be afraid of, but there's just... He's not in the story enough for that to work. And when he does show up, it's mostly like, okay, I'm just sitting here and I'm threatening you. That's all he does. Like, we see a little bit of his power uh, at the end when he fights Dorian, but that's it. And so, yeah, I don't have a whole lot else to say. It's just disappointing and frustrating so far. We'll see where it goes from here. Thanks again to Campfire for sponsoring this video, and huge thanks to all my patrons, especially my $10 and up patrons, Apo Sabalainen, Christopher Hawkins, Joseph Pendergraft, and a new one, Tobacco Crow, as well as all the other names here. If your name's on there, you're awesome. And if you watch this far, you're also awesome. Please, you know, like the video, comment, subscribe, try to spread it around so more people do that, and part two is coming eventually. Bye.